Hello and welcome to Full Contact Nerd. I'm Chris Alvarez and thank you for listening. I'm speaking with Jane Gilmartin, author of The Mirror Man, published by Mira, October 20th, 2020. Thank you for speaking with me. Thank you very much for having me. So first, um, so you probably have a lot of ideas running around in your head all the time. Um, how did this particular idea rise above the rest and become a book? Well, that's a good question. I think <laughs> I've always been kind of drawn to the idea of self-identity in terms of the way we see ourselves versus how the rest of the world sees us. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought it would be interesting to put a person in a position where they were forced to kind of see themselves for who they really were without any filters or anything else. And writing spec fiction, I, I, you know, thought of clones mm -hmm. and I decided I would turn it around. And as soon as I decided to turn it around and focus on the man who had been cloned and not the clone itself, mm -hmm. it really grabbed my attention. And I just, I found it um, enjoyable to write from start to finish. Mm -hmm. So then let's talk about the uh, novel itself. Tell me a, a little bit about the protagonist, the, con the setting, and the conflict. Sure. Um, Jeremiah is a middle-aged corporate guy who is uh, a little bit unsatisfied with his life mm -hmm. and gets an offer from a pharmaceutical company he works for to take part in an illegal cloning experiment. So they will give him $10 million mm -hmm. if he agrees to have himself cloned and have the clone live his life while he is cloistered in a secret laboratory mm -hmm. watching. Mm -hmm. Okay. In the book blurb, um, I think it says that eventually that as he's watching the clone, I guess it does, and I don't want any spoilers here, but I guess the clone starts to do things that, that uh, create real problems with his life in his life or something to that effect? Something to that effect. It's not so much the clone. The clone is actually very successful as a replacement, yeah. almost too much so. Yeah. And while my character is watching him, his life play out on a screen in front of him, mm -hmm. really the problems are his. He doesn't, he begins to not like what he sees and then he, finds all these nefarious kind of undertones to the project itself mm -hmm. and people in his life start paying the price and it gets out of hand and, and he's, he's, he's got to do something. Okay. Um, so did you do, I, I noticed that, so this is a hard science fiction book. It's, it's uh, false in that yeah. category. Yeah. Um, did you do um, research for this um, in any of the technologies you touch on in the book? Yeah, um, I had to, to an extent, I think you always have to if it's based on real science. Um, so I researched how cloning is done in animals, and I figured if it were to be done in humans, um, it would be much the same. So I researched that science, and then I had to kind of invent some science to go on top of that. How How would you mature a clone? within 48 hours from a couple of cells to a 47 year old man. Mm -hmm. um, so that part, of course, I kind of invented, but even the inventions you want for a book like this, I think you want them based on real, real science that's understandable and out there. Mm -hmm. So I found myself researching things like human growth hormone <laughs> and uh, I got really sucked down the rabbit hole in an mm -hmm. interesting way for all of that. And then I had to create a drug for this story um, that's responsible for kind of implanting the mind of the human into the mind of the clone. And of course, for that, you make it up. I based mine, it's called Meld in the book, mm -hmm. which is, you know, sort of a riff on, on the Vulcan mind meld from ah. Star Trek. <laughs> okay. <laughs> being, nice. being a Star Trek fan, I had to put something in there. Mm -hmm. Um, and of course, that's entirely made up, but I based it on things like mirror neurons in the brain. So I, I found myself doing odd research for this, even just to get a few lines or a paragraph here and there, or to understand, at least in my own mind, 
how things were working. Mm -hmm. Did you come across any science that sort of worked against your uh, plot that maybe you uh, either it changed the plot or it um, or you just decided to ignore it for the sake of your, your story? That's a really good question, because in, in, a, in a book like this, that so easily happens. Um, and, and with the drug that I was trying to create, I, I, I needed it to do many things. So halfway through the book, or very late in the book, I, I had to kind of change it into two distinct drugs. One that the, when two people take it together, they're taking slightly altered versions of mm. the same thing. So things like that ha have to change, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you touched on being a Star Trek fan. Uh, what are some of the other things, um, either books, music, uh, other television shows that, that inspire your imagination? Uh, I'm glad you said music because I am a huge David Bowie fan and, mm -hmm. um, he actually kind of did inspire this book to a certain extent. Um, he, he inspires me in so many ways. He, he points me to books and movies and all sorts of, of artistic endeavors. I might not even go after, but mm. he's got a line in his song changes mm -hmm. that, um, always stuck with me. It, it says, um, I turned myself to face me and I never caught a glimpse of how the others must see the faker. And that to me is very telling about what the kind of central theme of my book is. Basically when you do catch a glimpse of who you really are, the easiest and, and, and most instinctual thing is to, is to probably turn away as quickly as you can. And so again, that, that idea is is just what kept me going. I wanted someone who couldn't turn away. So I don't want this to be a question that results in a spoiler, but I'm getting the impression, maybe a mistaken one, that the character, the main character is not that likable a person and that, um, or maybe their circumstances are just rough. I, I can't quite tell at this point. Uh, maybe you don't want to say, but I'll just mention that. I think it, I think that's fair to mention, and I think um, um, he yeah he he makes an awful decision in the beginning of the book, and even though it's for ten million dollars, and he he may have his reasons, he does decide to leave his family for a year, which includes a son. Um, so there is that element, at least in the beginning, where he is a bit unlikable. I think it would have been way more unlikable if my main character had been a woman. And, you know, that's, um, it, that's part of why I, I felt like I really had to write in the, um, from the perspective of a man. And that sounds awful <laughs> saying oh, yes. that out loud, <laughs> but there's truth to that. Um, but I think watching this character change from somebody who is, a little bit unlikable to somebody who who is just a different person by the end of this bizarre um, experience he goes through mm -hmm. is is part of the interest. So where did um where did your interest with David Bowie start? Oh God, don't get me started. That'll be the rest of this interview. <laughs> <laughs> I, in, in a nutshell, I found David Bowie when I was sixteen in nineteen eighty. And I saw him on Broadway in The Elephant Man, and I was just blown away and mesmerized. And looking back on that, I'm really glad that I found him at that age in particular, because I think that when you're 16, you're really kind of becoming who you're going to be. Mm -hmm. and, and you're open to so many things. Mm -hmm. And I think you're so drawn to and fascinated by things. So, you know, Bowie used to send me, send me to the library. I would, you know, so many of the best books and most important books I've ever read, I read because of something in his lyrics. I really used to almost study him. Hmm. I'm sure you weren't the only one. I, you know, no, I don't say. think so. <laughs> I'm speaking with Jane Gilmartin, author of The Mirror Man. 
You can find more information about her work at janegilmartin.com. If you like this podcast, Full Contact Nerd, so far, please subscribe to it and rate it if you can. Please sign up for my weekly newsletter at fullcontactnerd.com or chrisalvarez.com to keep up with my latest posts. You'll also find written interviews and my social media links there. You can find the links to my other podcasts at militaryhistorypodcast.com and technologyinspace.com. And now back to the podcast. And how about, was Star Trek, were you into Star Trek before or after that? Oh, before. I was I was into Star Trek from a little kid. Um, I mean, my I had an older brother who was old enough to be really into Star Trek when I was very young. Mm-hmm. We used to fight. We used to fight over our one TV um, because Star Trek and Bewitched were on network television at the exact same time every week. Mm-hmm. So we would have to alternate. I, I think he still holds a grudge about that, but. Hmm. <laughs> so he was into Bewitched? No, I was into Bewitched. Oh. He was into Star Trek, and oh. I, I gravitated. Oh, I probably see. Probably when I was about seven. Oh, okay. I see. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the conflict between fantasy and science fiction, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's still a conflict today, isn't it? <laughs> Um, what, what about uh, any other science fiction that you were really into? Yeah. Um, in high school, oddly enough, I, I mean, I like all the classics, of course. Mm -hmm. Um, but in high school, oddly enough, I got really into, um, a a writer called Stanislaw Lem, Mm -hmm. um, who, who, who wrote Perks the Pilot was, was the first I picked up. Mm -hmm. Um, and I was just. I, I was so interested in what it really t- teaches you, I think, what you can do with a book, what you can do with words. Mm-hmm. And what and I still if I'm in a bookstore, I, I gravitate for the science fiction shelves mm-hmm. first. And um, I read a lot of. You know, uh, Kim Stanley Robinson is one of my favorites, and I don't know if he's exactly in classic sci-fi, but I absolutely love everything he's ever written. I can't wait to read his new book, which is sitting on my table, um, yeah. unopened right now. Yeah. I have a pile of, you know, a million books. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I know that. Yeah. I know how that yeah, is. You must, you must really. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how about things outside of, um, science fiction that, uh, that inspire you again, books, music, TV, and we talked about David Bowie, obviously. Um, yep. Any other uh, big things? Yeah. Um, there, you know, there are quite a, quite a few. I watch a lot of um, sci-fi shows on TV, and you know, I'm so glad to be living in the era where you can binge watch something in two weeks. <laughs> um, you know, rather than than wait a week for the next episode. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, I watch. I, I watch just about everything that comes out there. In fact, I spend way too much on, on streaming services. I just got <laughs> Apple TV. I'm all excited for the, the new season of Mandalorian. I can't wait. Mm-hmm. That, that's coming up right around the corner. I, yeah. I, I pretty much eventually get to everything out there. And I'm pretty good at finishing things, even when I don't love them. Um, Which... Not just science fiction. I think mm-hmm. TV today... Is, is is where a lot of the best writing is, mm-hmm. especially um, in in terms of suspense and just the the way that that's done. I think kind of informed my story and turned it into a little bit more of a thriller than it might ordinarily have been. Hmm. Interesting. I never thought of that, but I think that really is true. Hmm. So. Since you do watch so much, which which service do you think offers up the best um, sci-fi entertainment? Um, God, that's a good question. I what? use I. There was a time where I would have just jumped right in and and said the Sci-Fi Channel, but I've not. You know, they're not doing a lot of new original programming right now, so hmm. I I usually turn to Netflix. But I did watch something on um what was it i think it was apple Mm -hmm. 
um, for all mankind, which I found pretty interesting. And it was more of a drama took place. It, it was a historical drama that took place during the space race. Hmm. And um, it, it was really good. Definitely worth watching. Hmm. Is there has there been any sci-fi recently that you were surprised that it was as interesting or, or good as it turned out to be? You know, maybe something that you thought, oh, this will be okay, and then it really hit you harder than expected? The one thing is, is that pops into my mind um, are movies. Mm -hmm. I absolutely adored The Martian, and I had read that book before I saw the movie. Mm-hmm. And I loved the book, and I didn't think they could possibly do it justice on the screen, but I think they really did. And mm -hmm. that was that. That's just a fantastic film. Mm -hmm. um, and then Duncan Jones' Moon is probably since I saw that one, it's been my favorite sci-fi movie. It's absolutely amazing. Hmm. Yeah, that's on, amazing. That's I, that's on my list to see. So. Oh. You will love it. <laughs> I got to check that out. Would you say that your book has, what would you say the soundtrack of your book would be? And uh, what sort of aesthetic feel would it have? Hmm. I think, I'm not sure about a soundtrack. I'm one of those writers who writes with silence. Mm -hmm. Because I, I think it's because I'm, if I'm so, I'm, I'm so into music, it'll just stop my flow. Um, uh. If, if there had to be a soundtrack, it would have to be something dark, a little bit creepy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that That's a really good question. But, I mean, the aesthetic of it, I definitely think would be kind of dark, lonely. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting question. I I have a hard time putting anything visual or, you know, any sort of soundscape to it. Mm-hmm. And, and I asked the question sort of wondering, like, if they were to film, you know, if the book was were turned into a show or a film, you know, what would you imagine the, the feel of it to be? You know, you know. I do imagine that because um, it, luckily it has been optioned ah, nice. for, for a film. And um, they were going back and forth between whether they were going to do a feature film or a TV series. I think they're back on a TV series now. Hmm. And, you know, I got the film interest long before I got a publishing deal, actually, long before the book was even entirely edited. Hmm. Um, my agent sent it out to film agents in Hollywood, and within a week I was talking to all these producers. It was bizarre. Wow, yeah. And <laughs> what what struck me about that is that much of this book when you read it, much of this book takes place almost in a single room where you're almost literally watching someone watch TV. Hmm. And I thought, how is that so visual? Mm -hmm. And then I really thought about that because a lot of people say, well, how can I write something that's so cinematic? And that seemed to be a, you know, a almost universal feeling when people read even the early drafts of the book. And I think what makes it cinematic is that the reader is sort of put in the position of a watcher. And that was on purpose. I wanted the focus is very narrow. You're watching one man react to watching his own life. Hmm. Yeah. And so I think there's something about that that makes it somehow cinematic. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting question. I am. Um... I could imagine them trying to focus more on the clone's life if they were to film it, unless... Yeah. Well, who um, knows? Yeah. That would be interesting. Yeah. But yeah, that's, that's pretty exciting. If, if it, that... it was very exciting, believe me. That I, and it was just kind of surreal and, and surprising, but a lot of fun to, to think about it. There's supposedly a script out there that I'll get a look at one of these days when it's polished up enough. Hmm. Interesting. But I guess with options, they generally, sometimes the writers maybe get some, can give some input, but generally the producers control yeah. who, um, yep. who ends up writing it. Right. Exactly. They do have a good writer. Um, I, I, I won't say who it is, but um, an, an experienced 
writer that you've probably seen some some of her work and um it was very exciting when i found out who they had had mm. procured to write the draft so mm. cool cool well speaking of writing is there anything anything you would say that you do out of the ordinary to uh complete your drafts or or the final draft um yeah actually hmm. a lot of this book i always tell people much of this book was written when i was very far away from my desk very far away from my file mm -hmm. actually uh, walking with my dog hmm. i wrote a lot of it in my head all alone and got some of my best ideas at that point so mm -hmm. i think i'm i'm not one of those people who just kind of sits down and writes and see where it goes i like to have mm. have a plan almost a map so did you ever want to hurry the dog your dog home to get stuff down on paper <laughs> oh yeah that idea. poor that poor doggy <laughs> <laughs> that poor dog, I'm telling you. He he actually is in the book, that dog. <laughs> I was going to ask that. <laughs> yeah, because he helped me so much, mm -hmm. and I needed a dog for the story, so I just looked down at my feet, and there he was. Mm -hmm. He's going to want an upgrade in his dog food, I think, if uh, if you... Uh... <laughs> Sadly, he's no longer with us, but... Oh, I'm sorry. But you, I know. It's, well, he was such a good dog, and now I've immortalized him, which he deserved. That's good. Yeah. <laughs> no, yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. That's always sad. Oh, it's hard, isn't it? Yeah. Um, so how has your, actually, um, I think I read that you've done writing, you did, you did other kinds of writing before, um, mm -hmm. you had other writing jobs. Can you talk to me about other work that's, that you've done that's influenced how and what you write? Wow. Well, that's a really good question. Um, I was a, a news reporter, a journalist. Mm -hmm. um, I wrote, you know, straight news features. I was a newspaper editor. So that's what I studied mm -hmm. in school. And, and that was my career. And I think that I, I think that it really does influence the way that I write um, in terms of creativity. I'm not I'm not one that can easily write these incredible settings and these sweeping um and i wish that i were i really do I, I but i think my journalistic writing which is just you know very very straightforward get to facts kind of mm -hmm. um i think that informs the way i write and a lot of people have picked up on that and you either like that way of writing or or you don't mm -hmm. i choose to remember when people people call my my writing lucid and I think that's, I hope that's a compliment. Um, <laughs> I think it you is. Know. <laughs> but I, I think it does kind of inform the way that that you write. And I think um, it informed my story, too, because I, fi I do find it hard to write an awful lot about, about setting in a, in a kind of a beautiful mm -hmm. prose kind of way. Mm -hmm. And maybe that did influence my putting the book in such a closed space, although I think the story called for it. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, maybe maybe that's why I did it. My next book take, is it takes place on two different planets, so it's, it's proving mm. a little bit more harder to write, but I'm trying to challenge myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like to read a lot of police proced procedurals, too, which are very kind of yeah, stark. Same, same kind of vein, and... I, I like I like that kind of of a book too. I you know I because I, I, I think I gravitate towards story more than anything else. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. So so having said that, now is this this is your first published uh, fiction work? Yes, it is. Okay. Um. So how has and you touched on this a bit already, but um, how do you think your writing has changed over time? either from the reporting to this or maybe even within this, you know, before you, you found success yeah. to now that you've been published, how do you think you've changed your approach? It's kind of twofold. I think I find it easier to write because I learned an awful lot writing this novel and um, writing what I, what I refer to now as kind of a practice novel before that. And, 
I find it a lot easier to, to um, I, I know where I'm going. I know I kind of have a better idea of where to start mm-hmm. in fiction. Um, I, I, I have a lot more ideas on plot development and, and raising stakes and all of that. And I think those are, you know, kind of tech techniques, technical things that you, you really have to learn through, through doing it. Mm-hmm. I think it's impossible to, you know, you couldn't, you, you know, read an article. I, I think about how to do it. I don't think you could attend a class and, you know, do homework on how to do it. I think you just have to, to do it. Like, with the mirror man, when I was editing, I, I actually had to cut the first 100 pages of the story and in, in, in the first major rewrite and start the book in a completely different place. Hmm. And I think that's, you know, a real lesson, but it's, it's a double edged lesson. It, it's a lesson in, well, you, you should know where to start, but kind of ironically opposite from that it's a lesson in getting your background at least into your own head because i think it was much easier to write my character knowing where he came from and how he got there even if a lot of that didn't end up in the final draft Mm -hmm. so i i i I think that my writing through writing this book especially has changed i'm a little bit more forgiving of um, I, I will allow myself to meander a little bit in the writing because I really do have a sense that everything you're writing for the story is very valuable and useful, even if it gets cut. Mm-hmm. Right, right. How, how long did you wrestle with that decision to cut those first hundred pages? Not too long. I had a writing group that made that suggestion when they read an early draft of the book, and they, I'm sorry, they wanted me to start the book in a completely different place. And first I was a little upset. I was resentful. Yeah. <laughs> My goodness, you, you know, you don't want to take advice that's going to make you rewrite your entire novel. Right. Especially because mine was borderline too short to begin with. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was about two days before I said, you know what, they're absolutely right. They're not, they're not trying to, to steer me wrong. <laughs> so I started to rewrite it. And I read them the first two pages of my new first chapter and said, is this what you mean? And they said, yes. And then I wrote the entire novel over again in two months. Um, and it mer- was miraculously 20,000 words longer when I finished and much hmm. improved. Interesting. So I, I, I think yeah, I took that advice pretty fast and, and I ran with it. And you know what, even if it didn't work, the rewrite didn't work, at least I think you might have gotten closer to what you wanted to get to, you know. Absolutely. I think that um, as long as you can really kind of rectify big suggestions like that from editors or readers or whatever, I think if you if, if you know that it is not going to alter the story you want to write in any real way and you can understand where the advice is coming from and why it was given to you. I'm very open to things like that. And I I actually enjoy the editing process because of that. Hmm. I really like it. So without hopefully not spoiling it, but can you identify what made you come to the decision to do the rewrite? Like what particular thing um, convinced you that they were right? Well, um, they just, Basically, they wanted to get right into the experiment. They And they basically said, the experiment, the project that you're writing about is so exciting. Let's just get right into there. And, and you know, you find that hard because when you, I think when you start out to write a novel, it's such a big thing. It's a huge thing to, to, to um, be involved in. Mm-hmm. And you instinctively need that background you need to build a character and i was able to you know cut all that backstory but really get the important elements aspects and hints about that backstory um back into the book even within the first chapters first one or two chapters you know i i made a list of what the reader should be clued into um how they should feel about the character 
Sometimes it's done with a, a memory. Sometimes it's done with a gesture that, you know, maybe says something about where he is in his own head. Mm -hmm. um, but I try to really keep, put those things in there without taking the reader out of the scene, which was kind of exciting when I restarted the book. Hmm. It opens on a pretty exciting, creepy scene, so. Cool. What's the word count? Um. About. Uh, uh, it turned out after all the edits to be about 95, 96,000. Okay. Okay. I'm speaking with Jane Gill Martin, author of The Mirror Man. You can find more information about her work at janegilmartin.com. If you like this podcast, Full Contact Nerd, so far, please subscribe to it and rate it if you can. Please sign up for my weekly newsletter at fullcontactnerd.com or chrisalvarez.com to keep up with my latest posts. You'll also find written interviews and my social media links there. You can find the links to my other podcasts at militaryhistorypodcast.com and technologyinspace.com. And now back to the podcast. So af after the um, that first hundred page where yeah. you write, were there other big edits you had to do, or from that point on was the book? Oh, yeah. Um, I was lucky enough to have very editorial-minded agents who really... Um, who were really hands-on and, and very helpful. Um, and so I also was, I had two agents because my first agent um, ended up leaving the company and then I had a second agent and both of them were very editorial. Mm -hmm. They were really instrumental, very smart people. I was so lucky. Um, so there were um, nothing too major, not like that, not like taking a hundred pages and starting somewhere else. Um, mm -hmm. but, but just some really good ideas on how to, I guess, um, make the plot m move a little faster. So things like pacing, mm -hmm. um, to, to strengthen up some of the relationships in the book a little bit. Um, and so there, there was quite a bit of editing. And then when we got an editor, uh, uh from a publisher interested, she was, she she wanted some changes too so you know you discuss that and, and and you do those and again it was nothing major but it was probably one or two rounds of that and then just as she was about to take it in to you know try and try and get it purchased from the publisher try to get a deal she left her job too <laughs> and um i ended up with a second editor at at the same publisher who was interested and she wanted a new ending. So it seems sometimes like the result of uh, the revisions and the edits just never ended for me. Hmm. Um, and then oddly enough, once everything was all done and they had released the printed advanced copies for review, um, all of that, I was sitting in a doctor's office one day and I was reading an article about cloning as I, as you can imagine, you know, I do. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm reading an article, just sitting there reading an article on my phone about cloning your pet. Mm -hmm. And I, it was interesting to me. But the company that this article was about, brand new company, turned out to be the exact same name of the company in my book. So at the very last minute, <laughs> we had to change that. And it, it just seemed like, uh, is this ever going to end? <laughs> But it does make for a good story. The the weird thing that pops in my mind is so your book is about a you know a pair of clones and you had yeah. two agents, two editors, I, and now you had the two companies. Oh my god! I never thought of that. No wonder. I, it's a good thing I didn't rip about triplets or something. I'd still be at it. That's such a good point. That's so funny. Um. Yeah, I had clone agents and clone editors. And, oh, yeah, that's, I love that. <laughs> um, so let me ask now that we're on, uh, on this question, a, sort of a whimsical question. Um, when you were younger, was there any power technology or fictional setting that you yearned to have or to be part of? Oh, I I wanted to be in Starfleet. Hmm. 
I still want to be in Starfleet. <laughs> I think I want to be in Starfleet more now than ever. But I would be in almost any fictional setting rather than this current world. <laughs> I think most of us that. would, but yeah, you know, yeah. I I I honestly did. I and I still do want to be in Starfleet, and I I would just love to live in a world where it it just seems like you're driven to. To, to to make the universe a better place. Mm -hmm. What role did you imagine yourself having? Anything but a red shirt. <laughs> I was going to ask that. <laughs> yeah, I wouldn't do that. Um, I don't know. If 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 I were maybe science officer, wouldn't that be? That would be cool. That would be fun. That would be really fun. Yeah. I'd, I, I would need to go back to school. I'd have to go to Starfleet Academy. <laughs> I'm getting too old for that. Well, they have, uh, you know, all the t technologies they have, you know, you know, for health and everything. I think it would be just fine. Yeah, well, I probably would. I don't know. What, what's the what's the lifespan on Star Trek these days? <laughs> Actually, that's a good question. You would think that you'd have a lot of older people. Yeah. Huh. Interesting. It is. Um, let's see. Did you, so you mentioned some of what you went through in finishing the book uh were there any other difficulties or any difficulties um finishing or publishing the book apart from what you've mentioned already oh i i had um you know i i i had a lot it seems like i just had to keep jumping through hoop after hoop after hoop and and nothing was was ever kind of smooth but mm -hmm. you know like like i said i i looking back on it i got the real benefit of more editorial eyes than than most people are allowed you know <laughs> um but you know it was difficult and and i started this endeavor very late the i was writing my practice novel the day i turned 50 i found myself on my 50th birthday sitting in a writing workshop for the first time hmm. um and it was just something I wanted to try, and I was I had always wanted to do. Um, and I decided it was time to try. So I think, you know, even just my age was a, was a little bit difficult starting um, starting at fifty. But mm -hmm. you know, by the time I was I was fifty four, I had written a practice novel and then wrote the Mirror Man and sold it. So. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I, I worked very hard. I worked, I I really persevered through it. Mm -hmm. um, certainly learned a lot about what I can handle, which is a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you mean the amount of writing that you do a day, or or? No, not only that, but I think that um, also, you, you you learn a lot about yourself where you're 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 you know getting rejected by. Mm hopeful agents that you're sending it out to and trying to find an agent is, is I think much harder than writing the book is mm -hmm. trying to, um, you know, kind of sell it. Mm -hmm. Did you have, um, did you have rejections with like good comments or did you have many rejections that were like, um, thanks, but no thanks. Most of them were, um, I, I did have a lot with really good comments. Actually, I had a, a couple with, with, um, basically edit letters, which I was so grateful for. Mm -hmm. um, but most of them, I swear, were something along the lines of, I didn't fall in love with it the way that I wanted to. Mm -hmm. And and I read somewhere, some, you know, somebody else said it, but I, I kind of copped it because I understood it at that point. I, I don't want you to marry my book. I just want you to, to be my agent, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I, I, I mean... How do you make someone fall in love with your book I don't know. <laughs> when it's very difficult, you know, when you're at that stage and looking for an agent. But I always thought that was kind of uh, funny. I, you know, I got a ton of rejections. I got a ton of interest, mm -hmm. but it was, you know, I, until I finally got that yes from a really great agent. Mm -hmm. Good. You know? So um, what's your... Actually, you already mentioned it. Uh, you touched on it. Um, what's your your current or next writing project? You said something about two planets. Yeah. Um, 
it, it basically it's a it, it completely different story. Um, a, a few of the same themes. Um, isolation is is definitely a theme, but it's a story about human mining endeavors on on another far flung planet, mm-hmm. which happens to be inhabited. Um, and it's this mining and refinery has been going on for generations and is is now operating as a a prison Hmm. and it's it's a a kind of a you know um cautionary tale about uh, about hurting the climate um Hmm. and the people on that planet in in ways that are just absolutely unintended Mm -hmm. so i'm I'm, you know still early draft Mm -hmm. stages i've completed one draft and um, it's being read now by my agent, and and hopefully it will come to fruition because I've really grown to to really like the book. Is this a longer one than than Merriman? Um, I, I think it's actually going to end up shorter, at least at this point. You you really don't know mm-hmm. until you get through all those edits and revisions, um, the final length of the book. But I have a feeling it's going to be a little bit more contained. Interesting. So where can people find you online? Do you have a website, social media? Yeah. Um, I have, uh, I have a website that I'm still, you know, it's still sort of in, um, the working stages, but it's out there. It's just Jane com. Mm-hmm. If anybody wanted to, to, to find that. And then, um, I'm on Twitter. Um, What's my Twitter handle at Jane Gill Martin three. Mm-hmm. And I'm on, I'm on Instagram. It's I am a DJ one, two, three. I am a DJ one, two, three. Mm-hmm. Okay. And I'll spell your name for people. Um, for those other sites, uh, Jane is oh, J yeah. J A N E and Gil Martin is G I L M A R T I N. Cool. So um, that's all the questions I have. Do you have any final thoughts or words? I don't. You asked such interesting <laughs> questions, though, Chris. Yeah. You really did. And you, you you honestly made me think about the book in different ways, especially that one about the soundtrack. Now that's going to be <laughs> – pro- I'll probably be awake tonight at 2 in the morning looking over my Spotify for suitable soundtrack. I'll have to get back on that. Good, good. Well, either I I apologize or or you're welcome. I don't know yeah. <laughs> for keeping you no, up. No, I liked late. it. I liked <laughs> that question. I thought it was interesting. <laughs> good, good. All right. Well, thanks so much for speaking with me. Thank you so much. I really, really enjoyed this. Thanks. Thank you for listening. If you like this podcast, Full Contact Nerd, please subscribe and rate it if you can. If you want more fiction and fiction studies ranging from ancient mythology to modern-day sci-fi, fantasy, and horror, please sign up for my weekly newsletter at fullcontactnerd.com or chrisalvarez.com to keep up with my latest posts. On my webpage, you'll also find written interviews and links to my social media accounts on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. I also discuss art, acting, comic books, gaming, and much more. Thanks again, and keep imagining the past, the present, and the future.